We are live, uh, guys, now. We are going live. Hello. Papa Phil, how are you doing? Alright. How come you get a reverse picture sometime, Alex? Oh. Huh? Your your lettering on your t-shirts backwards. Now? And your son's on the right side on my screen. No, uh, Jim, Jim, you got to turn the view around and you got a setting in Zoom that says mirror image or whatever. Just to just to un uncheck that box. Alex looks fine to me and his son's on the right. But that's oh. only for you for your image, not not who you're watching. Oh yeah. Alex is not backwards. Yeah, he's fine on my end. Not on not on uh, <clears throat> Not on YouTube. I'm looking at the YouTube and that backwards. Yeah, oh, Alex, yeah. You're, you're correct here. Yeah. Where's that setting at? Under huh? preferences. Well, I got a Mac, so it's different on my machine than yours. If you got Windows. <clears throat> well, we'll wait, we're waiting for our star. Mm -hmm. um, waiting for Mr. Bob Heil. So, hi, everybody. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we got little Alice. Uh, hello, Papa Phil. How you doing? Doing okay. Um, going to California in a, in, a, in a week to be tested there. But uh, uh, nice. That's it. Just my camera here. So in two weeks to get tested there, and, and you you have probably uh... pardon. Which is you probably will have a a possible donor, right? It's two two possible donors. One one a direct exchange. One who's not a match, but could do maybe a paired exchange. So okay. we're just hoping. <laughs> That's good. How are you feeling, Phil? Uh, tired. I'm going to have to start dialysis uh, when I get back from California. Uh, today marks 12 years today for me since I donated. Wow. And I got a message yesterday from my recipient that he is now going to become a grandpa. Hey, good for him. No, Alex on the phone. Okay, I have a question about about the stepper IR beam. Does anybody else have one? Hey, uh, guys, good news. Uh, he just got home. As you say, today is a beautiful day there in uh, in uh, Chicago area, and uh, he was outside. That's good. We're going to have him very soon over here. So uh, I wanted to congratulate Eric, Kilo Delta 2 Hotel Whiskey Delta, for his 12th anniversary. Man, you're a big man. You're a big man. And uh, what you did. I eat my veggies when I was growing up. That's how I got big. Yes, I know you eat veggies. But what you did, donating your kidney to somebody. Uh, my my, my uh, question is, do you know the guy? Or he was a random person? He was a brother of a friend of mine. So I knew him, but I didn't know him too well. Oh, okay. That's good. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, we have here on the house. Do it, do it. <laughs> we have here from the top. Okay, we have here on the top, Kilo 9, Kilo Romeo Alpha, Kevin. Kevin, say hello to everybody. You're muted. How's it going, everyone? Hello, Kevin. Hello. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have uh, Chris, Kilo Yankee 4, Charlie, Kilo Papa. From Black Hat Radio, actually check uh, his YouTube channel. It's a big guy. It's a good guy. Nice channel. 
I see that scary looking guy Udell in there too. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Chris, you want to say hello to the group? Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, Chris. And uh, we also have Paul. Uh, he doesn't have his call sign on it, but I'm going to say it is Kilo Charlie Seven Sierra Echo, the boys of Washington State. <laughs> say hello, uh, Paul. Greetings from the Pacific Northwest. Nice. Hello. And we have Jean Lamont, November 3, HSM, from Philadelphia. Hello, Jim. Yeah, it don't matter. Hello, everybody. Hello, brother. And we have Alex down here in Cutler Bay, Florida. Yep, we're going to have our start very soon here. Florida. And uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, you were actually the bridge between uh, uh, me and Bob, and that's great. Appreciate it. Uh, your connection, man. That's awesome. Yeah. We have also America Broadway, Papa Romeo, Papa Phil. Hello, Papa Phil. Say hello to the group. Hello, everybody. I just want to again to thank everybody who participated in the K4P special event. I can't tell you what them meant to me. <laughs> it's astounding. They were all it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Turn that big. Oh, Papa Phil, I don't know. Did you hear? Were you on Wednesday night? No, I'm uh, sorry, I wasn't. No, you're good. So, uh, got a bunch of QSO cards. Once we get them all, I'm going to send them down to you. Yeah, Alex called me, uh, told yep. me that. That's, that's amazing. Uh, I've got uh, pushing 70. I got 70 recorded, and I probably got 12 of them sitting in my PO box. I got to go get. So, I got uh, another one today. Come in the at the house. I got one here today. That comes to the house, so. Got quite a few of them coming in. So okay, I do. Uh, you know, I I made one the the original the first contact. So I would like to should sure I get a QSL card for my contact? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, we haven't ordered them yet. I'm we're still trying to delay and see how many more are going to come in before we order them. Sure. Got to send one in, Phil. Yeah, That's good. I'm going to send mine too. I have to send mine too. Fortunately, I don't have any to send. <laughs> That's one thing on my, on my list I got to get to. Have you come up with a design for it yet? Um, I have to call the um, Sue on Chip QSL. She was doing that. I, I told her to take her time because we are going to wait one month to start chipping it. So I think this coming week, it will be, you know, the time that I, I mean, is, uh, you know, uh, Eastern, I don't want to bother her with, uh, you know, but I'm going to call her first time, first time on Monday. Okay, Bob Heil is here, guys. Uh, before I let him in, uh, we have uh, Charlie Mike 2, X-Ray November from Havana, Cuba. Joe, say hello. Say hello, uh, Jose. And we have uh, Papa Zulu 2, Yankee Tango, and, uh, and Papa Kilo, uh, Papa November 3, Papa Kilo Julia. Let me let the uh, star coming into the show. And uh, we have here Mr. Bob Heil, Kilo 9, Echo Italy Delta. Welcome aboard, Mr. Heil. Hi there. And how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And I'm very happy. And I'm glad that you sent us the QSL car. Very nice QSL car. You got and it. my good son, he, he is very happy. He actually was... Uh, Showing that to her nephews, you know, he have nephews and uh, he will yeah. show that. I uh, see, I have this. And he saw, uh, he showed the, the microphone and he said, yeah. this uh, uh, um, ham radio operator is the one who make this, uh, this microphone. They were all oh, nice. There are seven in 11. So those wow. are my step granddaughters. I think yeah. I will bring them to the hobby as well when they grow up a little bit. So welcome aboard. We have the full house here waiting for you. We wanted to learn from the best. From you. Well, what do we want to talk about today? There's so much to talk about. Uh, how much it's time do you bad. have? We have us uh, from here to 6 p.m. So oh. you choose the time. After you finish, we have the group here. We're going to ask you questions about audio or what, uh, the topic that you talk. If you want to uh, do it in two parts, you, if you want to talk about audio settings and then about any product like the uh, I know those uh, voice enhancement that you have and uh, 
good product so you can tell we learn from you and we maybe get benefit from that because i'm actually we are always looking for um you know get new new, new yeah. stuff okay well greetings hey, everybody. Hey, bob yes i got two questions for you uh is leo laporte really a minister not that i know of no i thought he was a minister uh second oh. question is your gold line microphone your best microphone? I, best, I, it depends on what you're talking about. <laughs> it's the best microphone for like Kenwoods and Yesus and things like that. And I even have guys using it on PA systems. It, um, okay. It, it's not the widest frequency range. I built it specifically for ham radio. In fact, when the TS-2000 came out, Kenwood packed a gold line with the first, I think it were two, three hundred uh, of the first uh, purchasers of uh, 2000 uh, had one of the gold lines. And that's why I built it. But it's a wonderful microphone uh, for ham radio that uses dynamics. ICOM is a different story. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Well, what I thought I'd do, I've been doing these since last March, a year ago, and we're just about to cross the 200th mark of doing these. I did one this morning again. Um, I love sharing this hobby. And I, I think that a lot of people over this last year and all these uh, many things I've done have gotten a lot from it, from all the emails and phone calls that I get. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you through just a few minutes of my history, where I came from, and then we're going to get into some of the science of it. I started as a very young kid. I was 10 years old, started playing the accordion. 1952, my parents bought me a Hammond organ. That was a big investment. Uh, that that uh, B3 Hammond uh, cost about as much as a car in those days. They were not wealthy people, but they did. I practiced very hard, taught myself how to play I, two years later, I became a professional. I was playing in a restaurant, making more money than my teachers. It was really quite something for a kid that was 14. A year later, I became the organist at the Fox Theater. Now, why I tell you all this is very important. That organ had not been played in over 20 years. There were 3,000 pipes from one inch to 32 foot. And um, the organist there was Stan Can. He was uh, kind of a celebrity around St. Louis. He played the Fox and he uh, tapped me to be a substitute and help him voice and tune those pipes. You'll notice I'm standing in the middle of a rank of brass trumpets. And as you run up and down the keyboard, of course, they were longer as you get lower in the pitches and it was shorter as you get higher. We had to voice them. Tuning was no problem, octaves, but voicing, it, you had to listen, mentally dissect what you were hearing. One couldn't be mold, uh, mushy, one couldn't be bright, or whatever you wanted. They all had to stay the same. Listening is a mental process, and that's where I learned to listen. And it's kind of sad because a lot of people don't listen. They just hear. And we want to be able to listen, go in and dig out what's wrong and what's right. My first ham radio station was that year. It was a Harvey Wells a TBS 50D and a, a Hallicrafter receiver. That big box and with my call over the top of it, that was an RME converter. That allowed that uh, Hallicrafter receiver to receive six and two meters. And it was very important because in those days, six meters, two meters, they were open all the time. It's hard for people to believe, but it was as good as 20 meters or anything else. I didn't need a general or an, an advanced license at that time. I was a technician for 17 years because I lived the license. I was building and experimenting. That TBS 50D is still with me. It's uh, right down there. <laughs> I was on the air this morning with it. Use it on my AM nets. Most of my operations, I'm on AM. 
and all that gear you see, a lot of it I built from kits back in the 50s and 60s, but it all works well. And you know, one day, it was a couple of weeks Sorry after I, Hello? <laughs> a couple of weeks yes, after sir. I... Hello? Somebody say something? No, no, that's okay. There was uh, somebody that would mute uh, themselves for a bit. Okay. That's okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> I was listening just a couple of weeks after I'd been been on the air and I heard this ridiculous signal. It was so distorted. It was awful. And what is that? Came back the next night. The guy was still there around that frequency. Now, now I'm new. I didn't know all of the controls on this receiver. And I happened to hit the BFO button. Bingo, a voice come out of there. It just happened to be on the right frequency. It was single sideband on six meters in 1956, unheard of. It wasn't even a big deal on 20 meters yet. And so I started talking to this guy. Yeah, I, I'm, I was fascinated by what was going on and he was just finishing to build this single sideband transmitter for six meters. Mr. Bob, was, um, by any sense, do you have the camera you used to show on camera? Because the, all of the guys I are, are you know, um, we have the guys on the chat also, and they say, well, we yeah. want to see him because. Uh, well, when... it's, it's a happening. Um, hmm. It should have done that for you. Let me do something else here. Um, let me see if this. I guess they wanted to see your face when you talk. Yeah, well, you, to see. you have to spotlight me so it'll come up full screen. I can tell you yes, that. Yes, I will, of course. Yeah. yeah, because I have to put uh, on the uh, view thing because yeah. there was no uh, video and then it, it, it appears in black screen, but I can put you on a speaker Yeah. right now on the speaker yeah. Um, uh, thing. Yeah, let me, tr let me do something else here too. Um, usually Wait. it just pops yeah. right up. Uh, okay, we'll get that going and this going. And... It over here. There we go. Hmm. Let me see if you can. I don't know. You should. This is all I ever do for everybody. Can you see that? No, nothing yet. All we see is a picture of you, Bob. Yeah, Bob, check on the bottom left where it says start video and make sure there's no red line across wow. the video. I never had. Let me let me do one other thing here. Just a minute. Let me do something else. Yeah, take your time. Uh, let me get this. Going. We're not in a hurry. We always hear from three to six. <laughs> yeah. Let me. Uh, Meantime, Alex is going to dance. Let me us. punch this up. If that doesn't work, I don't know. Are you seeing it now? Your presentation is now up. Did you you see you see K zero D G E? Yes, sir. Wow, that's really strange because I haven't done anything. <laughs> okay. Well, let me uh, go back because I you need, there was my first station. That was uh, the Harvey Wells and. Uh, the, the converter, that was good stuff. Go back one more. There's the organ that I was talking about. Tuning and voicing those pipes, it, it was it was just absolutely a miracle because I learned to listen. We had to voice and tune those pipes from one inch to 32 foot. But listening, it's a mental process. And we have to really listen, dissect what we hear. And not a lot of people listen. And that's one of the things they're going to help you with today. But I, uh, uh, I, I was working, Larry, uh, a couple of nights there. And I told him I come into St. Louis uh, several times a week to play the organ at the Fox Theater. He said, well, why don't you come by and see me if you have some time? I roll up in front of his work. He's the chief engineer of KMOX CBS Radio. He took me under his wing and quickly started 
helping me to build. I, I was just a, a nut and still am. And uh, we built this uh, transmitter. This was the first single sideband transmitter on the market from Central Electronics. It had plug-in coils. It was a kit and I built it and take it up to Larry, make sure he's doing it right. We got it going, no problem. But that's on uh, 20 meters. Wait a minute, how are we gonna get to six meters? Pretty simple. I went over to Walter Ash Radio and I bought a grill, grill, a mill and grid dip meter. Learned how to use it. Everybody should have one. Everybody should know how to wind coils and get the frequencies you needed. But we were on 20 meters with the transmitter. How do you get to, to six meters? Larry taught me how to use a Greenlee punch and make a, a chassis that we could put a, 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 a 36 mega cycle oscillator into it. And it worked really good. Plug that into the crystal socket, 36 and 14, we're on six meters. This station grew really quick because I was playing a lot and uh, being able to afford all of this. My parents didn't have to do anything, just let me do it. And I did. When the uh, NC300 came out and I think it was 58, I had to have that dream receiver. He'll be a Heath kit there also. But I was a nut for antennas. I was really messing around. So I put up a 110 foot roan and we had a, a Motorola dealer, K9 SGD. He was about eight miles south of me and had a uh, construction engineer. He had cranes and booms and all that. Those two guys put this tower up. Of course, I'm learning a lot watching them and helping them do this. The antenna is very interesting. If you'll notice, it's a Telerex, 36 foot long, but all of the elements are not horizontal and they aren't vertical. The reason was that Telerex was experimenting with the fact that your signal, when it leaves a Yagi, a horizontal Yagi, does not stay horizontal. It changes the polarity. It might change two or three times before it gets to the listener. And so what they did is they built what they called the spiral array. And that was what was on top of the 110 foot roan. It was amazing because it cut down a lot of the fading. A lot of times when you hear stations fade, it's not because their power drops or they're uh, bouncing off of something else. They're, they're changing polarity because a change from horizontal to vertical can be as much as 20 dB. I also put up another tower beside it it was a 50 foot tower and that had a, a 36 foot long two meter 15 element but i did that horizontal and the other one vertical and i put the uh, phasing harnesses down in the shack and i could change this just by flipping switches it was it was amazing we're going to get into that big time here in just a little bit but in 1959 i bought a six and two thunderbolt kit this is a kilowatt and a half amplifier on six and two meters I drove it with the central electronic. You can see it up over my head there. It was absolutely amazing because I, I was, uh, I didn't know it, but I was only one of a few on single sideband at six meters, and especially with that much power and antenna. I had a call from Bob Drake of the Drake Company. He called me one day. He said, "You're the guy that's got that big signal on six meters in the sideband." I said, "Yes." He said, "Well." we would like to invite you to one of our meetings. We hold annual meetings here and we call for papers. We want you to present a paper. How did you do this? I wanted Larry Burroughs to come with me, but CBS wouldn't let him off. So away we went. Where do we go? Dayton, Ohio. It was the Dayton Hamvention, 1959. It was in the Biltmore Hotel until 1964, it moved out to Hera. But they had taken all the furniture out of one of these floors. They had the Collins room, the, uh, the Hallicraft room, the Asian, no yes to yet. Hallicrafter, uh, Drake, Central Electronics, Mosley, all of these great manufacturers were there. I was really, really 
impressed because I used to read about them in the magazines. And here they were, real live people that I could talk to and learn things from. While I was there, there was a fellow from the UK, from the J-Beam company. And he said, uh, we'd like to have you do an experiment with that big power that you have. I said, that would be fine. He sends over a 128 element J-beam. And again, my Motorola friend, K9 SGD and K9 EBA, the contractor, they actually put it up. This was in a spare lot beside our house. That's a, a 40 foot roan uh, as the tower and a 40 foot roan for a boom. We had to build all the phasing harnesses and make sure they were all in phase or out of phase, whichever they needed. It was an incredible thing. Right above my head, you see there, is a pair of prop pitch motors out of a B29. That's what rotated it. That was the rotor of the day in, back then for, for big antennas. But I just kept moving and grooving. In 1961, I built the first sing, uh, the, uh, transverter for six and two meters. You put 20 meters in, you get six or two out driving the Thunderbolt. What I didn't know, and I learned this at the Dayton Amvention, I was one of the first 10 on single sideband on six meters. Uh, the ARRLs had researched it, and that's why I was there. They asked me to come and explain how I did it. Well, in, in 1962, I was hired by CQ Magazine to write a column, and the column was VHF single sideband. Well, it was so important in those days. It was really something. Uh, VHF was very powerful. Lots of activities. We didn't have repeaters and all that nonsense. Well, it was station to station, real time. And then when sideband started coming in, we could share how could we get on sideband. It was a place for serious VHFers to experiment and build things. We share a thing. I also built a, a transverter for two meters and another magazine called VHF Amateur. And I had the schematic. There's only three tubes in it, about a dozen resistors and that many capacitors. Big deal. Use your grid dip meter and away you went. But it, all of this stuff was so meaningful to me because it was really my college education. And I, uh, I just can't tell you how important that was to my life. I'd played for 12, 13 years, six nights a week. I barely went to high school. I meant I only went the required number of days. I did not have good grades. I didn't care. I was very, very well off. I didn't, I didn't need all that because I was, I had a, since the age of 14, I had a career. So I, I kind of got tired of all that. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to open a music shop in my little hometown of Marissa, Illinois. Now, I didn't know much about the music going on in 1966. I hardly knew who the Beatles were. I had a franchise to sell Hammond organs and Zenith televisions, but it quickly turned into something very different because a lot of the kids around there, they knew I sold Hammond organs and I was renting them to some of these bands. And I was doing all kinds of custom work, building three manual ones and tearing them apart so we didn't have all the wood to carry around. But they found out there was a guy with a soldering iron and they'd be bringing their amplifiers in for me to fix and away it went. And I uh, soon learned what was gonna happen in my life. Uh, the PAs in those days were nothing. They were just little columns. So I started building PAs, big ones, and uh, renting them to the Keel Auditorium and the Blues Hockey uh, Arenas and stuff like that. All kinds of groups would come in. Nashville groups were pretty prevalent because the rock bands really weren't much in t on tour in those early days. And then one day, my life really changed. I got a call from the Fox Theater. And he said, hey, you still have that big PA you were playing around with? And I said, I do. He said, talk to this guy. He puts Jerry Garcia on the phone. And if any of you are rock historians, you know what's coming. <laughs> the, the dead sound man who owned the sound gear was on probation 
out of the state of California. He wasn't supposed to be out. Well, they were going to sneak in this little tour with the Grateful Dead, go from New Orleans, St. Louis to the East Coast, New Jersey. And um, hmm, they did the, the uh, show at the warehouse in New Orleans. But the DEA and the FBI were there because they heard that they were they were skipping out of the state for a while so at the end of that show the band comes on to, to st louis they didn't have cell phones they had no communications we'll see you there at four o'clock well when they get on the stage of the fox where's owsley where's all the gear they call back on the landline and found out he's in jail now what so I talked to Jerry and I said, I have Macintosh amps. He was very uh, amazing. You have Macintosh amp because nobody was doing this. I didn't know that. I'm just a ham putting all this stuff together. And I had JBL's uh, speaker. I had radio horns with 250 watt JBL drivers, uh, Olson bins, big folded horns. Get that stuff up here. So we did that night was an amazing night. You can go into Google if you don't know the history of that night. You go into Google and put the night rock and roll sound was born because that is where rock and roll sound hit the market. I didn't know it. I'm just a ham having more kinds of fun than ever. Building big stuff, you know. I, that was a bass amp I built with a 30-inch uh, Electro Voice Patrician speaker. One interesting thing about that, all of the groups I work with, I had to be friends with them. If I couldn't be friends with them, I don't want to work with them because there were a lot of people out there that their ego was a little higher than the St. Louis Arch. I don't need to deal with you. And so these people were all friends. They would come to Marissa, Illinois. That was quite a chore because we were 50 miles southeast of St. Louis down in the coal fields of Southern Illinois especially Jerry, Jerry Garcia and I, we, we did all kinds of experiments together when he'd come to Marissa. But you're looking at a guy that has never tasted beer. I've never done any kind of stupid drugs, never smoked anything. So I'm a pretty straight guy with uh, some pretty strange friends. And uh, Jerry and I, as I said, we're just really good friends and one time they had they had gone on it on it la their last tour actually uh with me we had, we'd done that because we had gotten with another band but during that first tour when they left out of here to go to the new jersey he called me and said hey bob we're having trouble with you as it was that nothing working no he said they keep calling about ye old music shop he said, what's going on there? Well, that was the name of my store. That was what was all my speaker cabinets. I really wasn't in the sound business as yet, but yet I was. That night put me there big time. And uh, Jerry said, you know what? We're going to just call you Heil Sound. And so it was Jerry Garcia that actually named Heil Sound. I know a lot of people would say, oh, well, uh, his name's Heil, call it. No, it was Ye Old Music Shop. <laughs> they were having trouble saying all those words. <laughs> yeah, he was a great friend, and I miss him a lot. Miss him a lot. All of that went into Billboard magazine, that article, The Night Rock and Roll Sound Was Born. It was a journalist that was there at that great concert. So everybody started calling me all kinds of bands because we were the only guys that had a, a touring PA. I had leased a 40 foot semi and I bought an old Greyhound bus. We, we put 11 beds into that so we could sleep the guys. And it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it, we really had a great thing going and the bands loved us. The managers really loved us because everything got there on time and got put together and the show started on time. I show you, this is kind of fun here at the end. The, we did this band's first tour. Heck, we're still working with them. But this band, this was their first job, first tour 
that ZZ top without beards. No kidding. <laughs> We're still friends, of course. They're using our microphones now. But it went on from, you know, from there. It got really crazy. Uh, the, the who called me and we, we did so many. Uh, I think it was for like seven years total. So things are really progressing quite quickly. But I got tired of uh, some of the things going on and we started building stuff. Uh, I, uh, I built a, a large plant and we were building mixers, modular mixers. They weren't out there yet. They didn't even have mixers for rock yet. It was all like PAs for churches and stuff. And these were all modular. So if the guys would get out on tour on a, in a club tour and one of their modules went out, what do they do? Un, un, unplug it and put in a spare because you always got a spare kit when I got it for you. Same with the power amps. I was really into that. We had 35 people working in the production lines. My brother-in-law had the wood shop. We had our own fiberglass shop. We were building stuff like crazy. And uh, building large arena sound systems. In those days, why we're now up uh, uh, into the mid-70s, the, the festivals were happening. And we were called on to do a lot of festivals. We had three large systems on the road with the... Uh, all the different bands we were working with. Well, when we did festivals, I pulled them all together and you notice there's three uh, left, right, center, and they were all mono, of course, but that less, let us have two stages in between them. So one could be setting up while the other was playing. That way the kids didn't get in much trouble. <laughs> there was always music going on, but these were, uh, these were monster things. We did this right. But, um, uh, what I didn't feel right is so many of them went that way. And I felt really sad about that. I wrote the book. So many people would ask me, how'd you learn all this? Where'd you learn this? Oh, I did it from ham radio. No, no. How'd you learn it? Ham radio. And it, it became the Bible for live in, in sound engineers. Cause I, I did it with language. They could understand. You didn't have to be an engineer. We're not engineers. And it really was quite, cool. I, I felt really good about it. I'll do one more thing before we get into the real serious part. Joe Walsh and I met up when Joe was with the James gang. And we, we knew uh, two days, uh, two shows into that tour, we discovered we were hams and oh boy, from there. <laughs> oh, we're still buddies and friends and working on things. But he was, um, he was thinking about a new band, a solo band. He'd pulled out of the James gang and do barnstorm. Well, he had went to Nashville to record the signature album and especially the signature song. Every album has a, you think of a band and you can think of one song. Yeah, they have a lot of them, but there's always one. It's kind of the title of that band. And, um, when he got to Nashville, he was good friends with Dottie and Billy West. They were steel guitar players, friends of Joe's. And they went to Pete Drake's studio. Pete had a steel guitar studio and did a lot of uh, top uh, recordings there. He had this little box he'd built and had a little three-inch speaker and a funnel and a little hose. And he put it in his mouth and he could kind of make wah-wah, wah-wah sounds. Well, Joe recorded Rocky Mountain Way with that box. But we were building things for his new band, and it was going to be loud. He said, Bob, what are we going to do for this box thing? And so, two hams. No is not in our vocabulary, right? <laughs> so we took a 100-watt driver, built a high-pass filter, did all the plumbing fittings to fit the uh, surgical tubing in it. And bingo, it was a Heil talk box. And you know that what we're talking about, it was this. Yeah, all from that crazy little talk box. I didn't know what was around the corner. <laughs> but we also, we, we had done almost every show that Humble Pie did in America when they were over here in the beginning. One of their guitar players was Peter Frampton. 
a young Peter Frampton. He was only like 17, I think. And uh, his management pulled him out and said, hey, Heil, make this guy sound good because he's going to be a big star. So we did. The first band was Frampton's Camel. Didn't last long because he was thinking of something else. In Marissa, my dad had a, a, about a dozen homes that he rehabbed and he rented to people. Well, about half of them were rented to rock and roll roadies and people. They lived in Marissa. They moved in from the UK because they had a job. And, and a lot of them, you know, if they came over here with a green card, they either had to get a job, get married or get out. What happened to that? Anyway, I would, I would give them a job. Of course I did. They were roadies and building gear. So that worked out perfectly. One of them was the manager of Humble Pie. And he met up with this little gal. Her name was Penny McCall. And they got married. But wait a minute. We don't have a church or whatever. So they were married in our home in Marissa. It was fun, man. It was a big hippie wedding. Let me tell you, there were no drugs. There was no booze. That was my first thing. My wife said, no, no. And they respected that. And it was cool. And Penny McCall and Mick Brigden were married there. Well, about a year later, I get a call from Penny and she said, hey, I am now with Peter Frampton. That's what she was trying to do in the first place, by the way. <laughs> I'm with Peter. I need a Christmas present for him. Don't send him guitar. He's got a lot of them. So what did I do? I sent her a talk box. In all the interviews, you will hear Peter say he will give homage to myself for giving him that talk box. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy and it went on from there richie sambori and so many other other groups it was it was really a wonderful thing but i uh, i got tired of all that i've been doing that for 12 years i'm going what's going on here so i i got into the satellite business big time we were doing thousands of c-band satellites when it came out uh, direct tv uh, hired me in 91 to be a test station for them, an experimental test station because they had put the satellite up. And I was also in those days, I was on radio. I, I spent 25 years uh, on uh, K KMOX here in St. Louis. Of course, it was it was a radio station from all over the, it covered all over the U.S. And so um, I, I had uh, a lot of people that had listened to me and knew what we were doing with all these things. And um, I also was on ABC television here in St. Louis and on their network. So when the uh, direct TV guys hired me, why well, we were talking about it a lot on radio, but the day direct TV was born was the CES show in um, Las Vegas, and we went on ABC television to tell everybody, hey, all this stuff we've been telling you, it's true, it's here. And we sold the first, we were the first dealer, sold, I don't know how many, hundreds of those the first day. That's the front of Heil Sound these days. In those days, it was our satellite and home theater business. And uh, that's the vice president of RCA. He came to watch us put in the first system installed in a home. But I did a lot of home theater stuff. I was really into it. And I, I'm not talking about little four and five hundred dollar things. We were talking about big time home theater. Uh, this one was three hundred thousand dollars. It was high def. Uh, the uh, projector was high. Def. Now, this is 1986. Think about this. <laughs> the only high def uh, program we had were laser disc. But people had lots of them, and it was a wonderful thing. And, of course, why I got into this was because of the audio. And the home theater was a big deal. Uh, I also worked with uh, Ray Dolby uh, because I introduced his first ProLogic receiver so we could get uh, rears and uh, center channels from two signals. And that was always 
kind of an interesting thing for me. But um, we, we, we got into all kinds of things. And, and I got into designing homes. A lady came in one day and says, hey, I got this old house. Can you do something with the basement? Of course I can. That's what we did. That behind that curtain was that crummy looking room. Another guy said, what, you, what can I do with this room? Well, that's what we do with that room and so on and so forth. I said, okay, enough of this. <laughs> I, I just went through so many careers and they were all going at the same time. I had lots of balloons in the air, but I get this phone call one day that changed my life. It was Paul Klipsch. Paul Klipsch is the father of the folded horn. He actually was the father of high fidelity in the late forties. He was the guy, Paul, uh, uh, they're standing in front of one of his K horns, that folded horn. What was so unique about that, it was a, like a triangle thing. And it sat in the corner of, of your room. And you needed two eight-foot walls. And when it was put into the corner, those two eight-foot walls of your room was the last 16-foot. Your room was actually the speaker. And if you've never experienced a, a K horn, Oh, buddy, it was incredible. I learned so much from Paul. He called me first of all. You the guy that got that big PA? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I want to come and see this. I'm going, oh, my gosh. He's going to cut me off at the knees. <laughs> nope, not at all. He flew his Bonanza airplane up to Marissa. And all day long, he said, why'd you do that? Well, how come you did it this way? Well, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And he was... He was pretty amazed that I didn't have any kind of engineering degree. You learn all this from what? Ham radio. He was, he was a marvelous friend of mine. We became really good friends. Put me in his airplane. We go back to Hope, Arkansas that night. And the next couple of days was absolutely incredible because he taught me things. Now, in those days, it was very difficult. I had to go to libraries. All I'm doing is taking notes. And I had to go to libraries and spend a lot of time to research what he was talking about. He wanted me to learn. He couldn't teach it to me in a day or two. You guys and gals have it easy. Google <laughs> anything. Well, one of the things that we talked a lot about was my sound systems and what we had did for equalization and the phasing of the speakers and all these things. He put me into the studies of the Bell Labs. I want all of you to pay very close attention. You might want to take some notes now because now is when it gets good. He referred to the studies of Bell Labs. That was the idea factory of the 1920s. Bell Labs was the consolidation of two American Telephone and Telegraph and Western Electric. They combined that. And Western Electric was the manufacturing arm of the Bell system. They had, you ready for this, 4,000 scientists and engineers assigned to the newly created Bell Telephone Labs. They were fully dedicated to researching how the human ear worked what frequencies were most important to understand the spoken word. Oh my. Hmm. Why did he do this? What was the deal? Here's the deal. They were putting the telephone system together. And uh, when they did, they ran two wires from New Jersey, the Bell Labs, all across America, to California. Remarkable. Every 50 miles was a relay station that kept the frequency up, kept the level up. All of these things were beautiful, linear, all the way through. When they turned the first telephone system on, this is what they heard. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, well, yeah, but it's not very clear. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. I'm just talking in the phone. Well, then we have a problem because it's not very articulate. Hmm. So what did they do? Hey, 
they put those 4,000 scientists on the case. There really were 4,000 scientists. Wow. Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson were the lead engineers. And what they discovered is the fact that our ears are nowhere flat. We cannot live with audio that's not equalized. And to understand the spoken word, these guys figured out the spoken word had to have that. That's what you have to do to your audio. And it's so similar to amateur radio because the telephone system was only 300 to 3,000 cycles. Wait a minute. That's kind of like the bandwidth that you play with. But does it look like that? Well, if it does, this is what you sound like. You're very soft. The articulation's gone. The difference of an F and an S, a P and a B, they're not very distinguishable. But if we bring up that 2.5K, and that's all I'm doing here, that's all I'm doing. I'm not playing in any games here. This is all science, baby. I'm only bringing up the mid-parametric equalization and up she comes. And the minute 2.5 hits, you'll know exactly when it hits. I did not turn anything down. I just brought that 2.5 so it was screaming over the top. Now, the F and the S and a P and a B, they're, they're very distinguishable. And that is how I opened my eyes to what was going on. Because to make things work, you have to roll off everything under 100. They only muddy things up. A waste RF energy. Maximum speech articulation occurs between 2 and 3K. That's where you want your RF to go. The proof of this is all coming from those wonderful engineers and scientists. And so this really, this really woke me up because I, I hadn't, like so many of you, I didn't know all this stuff. I'm just lallygagging around with what was there, but it wasn't right. And so these are things that we're going to dig into. First of all, I got back to radio in 1966. I went to Atlanta. We were actually doing a a trade show for our home theater stuff down there. And I went to an FCC office, got me an advanced license, which later turned to extra. But I got back on the air. I went, bought some gear. And uh, of course, as normal would have it, I had all kinds of gear I put together. <laughs> got back on 40 meters, bunch of really good guys we were working with. And that's where we developed some of the microphones and stuff. But one of my first things, I got back into radio and, and I didn't hardly know any hams at that time. And so <laughs> the local guys in Marissa were bringing me their CB radios and I'm going, I don't want to know about this, but they were broken. And they said, can you fix this thing? I'm like, okay. So I kind of got intrigued. I, yeah, I can fix this. I never got on the CB radio, but I was fixing them. But I'm going, you know what? If I change this crystal and rewound this coil and wired that to here, I could put this on 10 meters. Yeah. And at that time, 1966, boy, things were really happening. The sunspot cycle had went way down in the 70s, but it started coming back up just as it did when I first got in back in 1956. So I'm going crazy. I took a CB radio and hmm, it was a high gain. Wow, that was really easy. I just changed one crystal. Yeah. Tuned a couple of the output coils. No problem. But hey, Motorola had come out with a chip that took it took AM audio 
and made FM out of it. Really? I was the father of FM radio and amateur radio, if you didn't know that. What I discovered was high gain was going bankrupt. I called Andy Anderson, the guy that owned it and all that. I said, what are you doing with all this stuff? He said, well, I got to get rid of this junk. I got truckloads of printed circuit boards that are working. They're, they're already populated. Wires hanging out of them. You just have to put them in a chassis. I said, well, I'll buy them all. And I did. And I came up with what you're looking at. I built a kit. I went to Tintac. Tintac had a really cool thing going. I, I miss it a lot. They had across the street from the Tintac uh, ham radio place. They had a, 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 a work, a metalworks company, and they made thousands of chassis for all kinds of people. It had nothing to do with ham radio. Well, in my case, it did. They built my chassis, silk screened it at our plant because we still had all our silk screening and I call it the FM 10. You will notice it does not say high all sound. It says Melco Marissa electronics company because aha high all sound was not born yet other than the touring company. And that was closed goodbye. And I didn't know what was going to happen. So for those couple of years during all this 10 meter FM, it was Melco. I wrote the book because I was named the father of 10 meter FM. We did all kinds of things, taking any kind of CB, usually any, any, there were a couple we couldn't do it to, but uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I, I enjoyed that so much when 10 meters was really happening. And I, uh, I loved all of that. But I, then when I got back into radio, I'm going, what happened to my Art Collins audio? Holy smokes, give me a break. Because everybody was mushy and bassy and oh, boy, it's all good now and you're distorted. Well, I got my compressor on. Turn it off. No, I got to have it because Bill said it's good with the compressor. No, it's not. Turn it off. It's not clean. I mean, I was having fits. I really was. Let me get this back. Gosh, how is ham radio going to exist if this is what was going to continue? <laughs> so I said, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I built an equalizer. It was a two-band equalizer. Uh, maybe many of you might have had one of these. We built thousands of them. It was the first equalizer in ham radio, 1982, I did this. Two band EQ, I set the filters at 160 and 2.5K, of course, remember what the scientists told us. We had to be able to equalize. We need to raise up that 2.5K. We certainly didn't want to notch it, but we did want to notch the bass at 160. We want to roll that baby off, so I did. I wrote an article and I sent it to QST. The editor called me and they were going crazy. They said, this is something pretty special. This will become the lead article of July, 1982. And it got the cover award. How blessed, how wonderful. Because they told me this is not just a build-it-yourself product, which is what it was. It was a DIY. Uh, I didn't never intended us to build it. But they said it's a revelation. There has never been any equalization in ham radio. And you just did that. We need to tell the world about it. And they did. Well, it kind of backfired <laughs> because I wanted you guys and gals to build it. Some did. We were selling the kits, but a lot of people you build it so i opened my plant it had been closed for two years i opened up a part of it called some of my best solder gals and we were off and running building thousands of eq 200s but the whole deal is that it really did make things happen and um, in 1999 i get a letter 
from Dr. Inouye, Inouye Communications. He had a picture of his station and it had my EQ200 and one of my gold lines. Holy smokes. I, I was very shocked, impressed, blessed. Whoa, this is, this is the guy. I'm thinking of new radio. And I won't put your equalizer in it. And he just wanted to make sure that the frequency they choose were right. They could have done this without me, but they were just checking. So from the Pro 1 ICOM, I think it came out in 99 or 2000, from the Pro 1, Pro 2, Pro 3, all the way through to the 7610, the 7300, and, oh, baby, they just sent this to me to, to work on. What an incredible box this is, if any of you guys and gals have it. The 705, is this something special? Whoa, this thing is a 7300 plus two meters, 430. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's got D-Star, all kinds of stuff, battery operated. Why did he send it to me? Because they wanted me to build a headset for it, and I did. Our headset works beautiful in it. We have one that's got the right plugs. It's got very strange plugs on it. That's the problem. You can't, there's nothing like it out there. What is, what is the model, the model of the, uh, of the headset? It is called the HTHI, Handy Talkie Headset I. This also works in some of their handy talkies. And as all of us know, without equivocation, Headsets for handy talkies are total rubbish. They're terrible. This thing, you're never going to hear that with that name on it. I won't let it happen, of course. But we're very proud of that. It really brings a headset into the handy talkie world. It sounds good, and it works beautiful into the uh, 705. So we're, we're happy about that. So we had all the equalization going, but the biggest problem is to try to understand how to adjust a radio. Here comes some good parts for you. Proper mic gain. How do you adjust microphone gain? Well, I've been on here and Bill said do this, do that. No. You watch the ALC meter. In fact, if you have a 9,000 Yesu, there is no ALC meter. You pay $15,000 for a radio and there's no ALC meter? No, because I designed the equalization for that. We'll get into that in just a minute because it's kind of special. And it has a mic meter, microphone gain. Doesn't say LALC. But that's what the ALC meter is. So this identifies it. So there's no question. You do that so it's not slapping the red all the time. That, that's a big problem. Uh, you, you have to be able to adjust your radio. So just once in a while, it might hit the red, but very, very seldom. And that radio also is the first and only ham radio out of thousands of them that have an XLR in the front. It has balanced line, XLR, just like all of the broadcast microphones. It's XLR, it's balanced. We're gonna get into that in a minute. But it's, there again, it's all about adjusting that radio, getting that mic gain right. You wanna then, you want to do the bandwidth. That's one of the first things you do before you ever begin to grab a microphone. Set the transmit bandwidth. If you're going to do contesting, you're going to roll that baby down to 2.1. No, it's going to sound terrible. But all your power is going to be where you need it. You're not wasting it in the bass. You're not wasting it in the extreme tops. 2.4 is a little better. 2.9 is nice for rag chew. There you can get some very beautiful sounds by e sounds by equalizing and stuff at 2.9. No compression. You don't need compression. No. And if you do, very little. And then you want to equalize and you want to set it right. Well, 
ICOM has it really nice in all the radios. We, we made really nice graphics. They actually started out looking like this, <clears throat> the Pro 1, Pro 2. It was a graphic somewhat, somewhat like that. And um, we set the frequency. The bass is at 160. The trebles at 2.5K, just like they told us. And before we did any of this, there's another control that you set that bandwidth. I always set it at 2.9 for me. But you roll off the base, minus 2 plus 3. Very simple. Well, you go back to the 7300. It's the same thing. Just the graphics are a little different. There you have minus 2 plus 3. But before you do that, set that transmitter bandwidth for 100 to 2900. Then you have a really decent thing. I like to do it at 200. I roll off things under 200. It, it really sounds good. And that works well. What are we going to do about the DX guys? Come on. Hmm? Well, first of all, we want all of our power to be around 2.4, 2.5K, let me tell you. And so we set the bandwidth 500 to 2,500. And then notch all the base you can, minus 5, the treble at 2.5K, plus 5. Bingo. Is it pretty sounding? No, it's terrible. Well, why would you do that? You did that because we want all of our talk power to be right in that frequency range that you heard a while ago. So what I did... I designed microphone elements to do that. And here's a lovely little demonstration you probably will never forget. I hope most of these you'll always remember and live by them because these are scientific things. These, these, these guys knew what they were talking about when they taught us how to do it. This is our Pro 7. It is the headset. I don't care what you want to bring up against it. No. I worked for several years to do this right. And it is. First of all, let's listen to the element. This is our HC74. HC74 is just unbelievable for the contesters. Does it sound good? Nope. Doesn't sound good at all. Well, then why would you have it? Because I want all of my power in that 2.5, two as we, we heard a while ago. I don't want any bass. I want all the treble we can get. So this is the magic for the D Expeditions. While I'm here, this headset's pretty cool. Thousands of them out there. It has a lot of features that no other has. And it's all things I learned from Paul Klipsch and other people that I listened to. First of all, I put a balance control because a, a lot of you would ask, ask for this. Many of the things I do is because of you guys and gals. It's a balance control because if you have hard of hearing on one side, this baby rotates either way. It has another jack right here that you can plug the logger into, or just somebody who wants to listen. You don't need a bunch of Y cords. Just plug them right there. All of our headsets, every one of them, have a steel band. So if it's a, if it's pinching your head, don't get on eham and say, that crazy Ohio headset hurts my hand. You didn't read your instructions. Really. <laughs> it really bugs me when people say, your headset hurt. No, it shouldn't. Because you can Bend it, make it fit your head. Or if you got a pin head like me, <laughs> all of our headsets do that. We have a way to do that. And then last but not least, it's the only headset in the world. And we've been doing this for many, many years that has phase reversal. Why in the world would you have phase reversal in a headphone? What kind of stupid is that? Well, it's not stupid. If you're in a pileup and you hear a little weaky back here, reverse the face and he comes up front. You can move signals around in your head acoustically. And it's all because of phasing. 
And so you want to pay attention to some of these cool things because they're all out there. ICOM also asked me to build a microphone because they don't all build their microphones. They buy OEM things, paint them the same color, and bingo. No, it's terrible. This one I developed specifically for ICOM. It won't work on Kenwood, won't work on Yesu. It's only for ICOM. We other, have other microphones for the other guys. And it works beautifully. About 100 bucks and away it goes. It's wonderful. Called the ICM. It almost spells ICOM. Well, a couple of years after we uh, did the, uh, the uh, equalization with Yesu, or with ICOM, Yesu comes to me. In fact, Dr. Dr. Hasegawa come to Dayton to my booth. He says, I want to do that better. I go, oh, okay. We could do parametric. Yeah, that'd be good. I said, ah, not so fast. Why? I said, education. What do you talk about? I said, well, with two-band shelving, I was the engineer. I pick out those frequencies after a long period of trial and error and listening to 4,000 scientists. <laughs> with parametric, you don't have two knobs, and they're already set. All you get to do is boost or cut. With the parametric, you have nine controls. Nine. And this is why I hear a lot of Yesu owners on the air in the default mode. How sad. I developed the most beautiful equalizer in the world. And you turn it off. Why? Because you're afraid. You're embarrassed. Nobody told you how to do it. Education was not done. All the graphs and stuff they do in their manual, it's all, I, I don't even understand that. How could you tell us how to do it, not all this nonsense? And it's really simple. If I had a 10-year-old child and I brought him right here beside me, knew nothing about radio, in the next two minutes they would totally know how to set up a Yesu. So can you? Here's what we do. There are three filters. Parametric, meaning you can change the parameters of these filters. You can't do that with this because I set them. All you can do is plus or minus, which is fine. Works great. But to go further, the parametric means you can change the, the parameters. Let's take the first filter. It has three controls. The frequency, the level, plus or minus, and the bandwidth, audio bandwidth, how, how wide is that going to be? What we do is we set that first filter. Back on here. <laughs> set that first filter at 200 hertz. We set the level at minus 3 dB. We're going to cut that. We're going to notch that. The bandwidth, I always do two octaves. You can get in all kinds of conversation arguments just set it at two octaves and don't worry about it that means how wide it is you can play with it but this is good starting point that's where we are the second filter you set at 900 how come you do it at 900 Heil? very simple there's something about the human hearing system and i learned this from the scientist i learned it from all of the thousands of shows we've done over the years do this for me take your hands and put them over your ears you hear that boxy weird sound that's about 900 to a thousand hertz let's get rid of it well not rid but let's reduce it and so the second filter you said at 900 minus three two octaves Hey, what's so hard about this? And you know where we're going to put the th third one. You know where we're going with this. 2.5K plus a, whoa, was that difficult? No. Frequency, level, width. Frequency, level, width. Frequency, level, width. Very simple. But now, be, sh be sure that you have set the transmitter bandwidth. That's another uh, another menu. Set the bandwidth for whatever you're going to do. I always keep my bandwidth somewhere around 2.7, 2.9. Works great. 
And then pay attention, pay attention, big attention. Listen up. Yesu is the only one. After you do all of this, there's a save button on some of those. Make sure you save it or it won't engage. And so that's it. How simple was that? All of this is on our website. Uh, I, I, I have all, there's many, many pages under the support at Heil Sound. You'll find all things ICOM, all things Yesu, all things Kenwood, all things Elecraft. They're all there for you. And so you're going to be in good shape. You're going to be okay. And if you aren't, you email me. My call at ARRL, Bob at Heil Sound. You email me. We'll get on Skype. We'll talk about it. We'll help you. I love doing that. I spend much of my day helping guys and gals, and I love to do it. One of the other things that we have to do is to teach you how to use a microphone. <laughs> yeah, Heil, I know how to use a microphone. Do you? Because I hear a lot on the air that don't. Here's what I'm talking about. You cannot be two feet from a microphone. And if you have a desk stand, makes it kind of weird because you have to get up on it. Why? I learned this from the scientists. See, the, this is all out there. You want to get into Google, you can find it. I had to go to the libraries. It took me a long time, several years to really dive into what we're talking about. Every time you double the distance of the source, you lose six decibel. Think about it. If you double your power, if you have 500 watts and you go to a kilowatt, that's double. That's only 3 dB. You're going to lose six just by doing that. You can hear what I'm talking about. You also lost transient response. That is the element. When you speak into it, it drives it down into the magnet. How fast does it come back? If the magnet is strong enough, that's the problem. Most of these things aren't. They're just toys painted the same color. Believe me, I work for these companies when I'm behind the scenes in their plants. I'm going, no, don't do it that way, but they do. Transient response is very critical because it helps the distortion factor. The other is dynamic range. And if you take a microphone, you lose all kinds of stuff. You get it down here. Oh, well, shut up, pile. You just crank up the game, buddy. You just tank it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I sound like I'm in a roller rink. For that reason, I brought booms to this industry in 1980. Right after I'd gotten back into it, because I'm always soldering and do things, I said, man, we got to do this right. That's why we, we sell thousands of booms, not only to this industry, but the broadcasters and all that. The other one is about plosives. All humans exit air when they speak, some lots more than others. And what you have to do to cure it with our microphone you can talk off the side. You can't do this with every other microphone. You have to be right here. You know, you've seen all the entertainers. That's why they got to be here. They can't move around. Well, all of ours are omni on that front. And they have wonderful rear rejection. So you see, all of these things play into making your signal better. But this comes with all of our microphones and microphones. You want to be able to put your filter. It's an acoustic filter, but it's acoustically transparent. I'll hear guys on the air every once in a while. Hey, Joe, take that stupid muff off. You're all muffled up. If that's true, it's not right. It must have been a dollar at Walmart. No. This is a scientific piece, honest. It's acoustically transparent. When I put it back on this mic, it doesn't do anything to harm the audio. It only diverts the air. 
So these are things that all mean something to us. And we're so blessed because so many people are using all of our different microphones and headsets. And we also have a custom shop where we can design and do all kinds of beautiful things. And it, it ended up that uh, in 2006, Sarah and I had a, a second home just to get away home out in California. I went out there to help Joe a little bit. And uh, we're sitting at his kitchen table one day and he said, hey, Hal, you got to build me a better microphone. I said, what do you mean better? Well, <laughs> you know, this thing. Well, I got to hold it right here. I can't get away from it. And I want one for my instruments to get rid of all the stuff back there. Build me a better microphone. Okay, we can do that. So I started working. Took a little bit of time to do it, but we did get the job done. Came up with this microphone that has become the microphone for broadcasters. First of all, we were the first company, and the only company, that came up with a large dynamic diaphragm. Sure tried it, failed. How do I know that? Bob Shuline was their engineer for years. We were good friends back when I was traveling with, traveling with the groups years back. He came to me one day after all this went, wanted to know the secret. How'd you do that? Because we couldn't do it. No. Two ham radio operators figured it out. A million dollar engineering staff should have been able to figure it out. They didn't. All other microphones have four little holes spaced evenly around the edge. Those little bitty eighth inch holes are for all the rear to come in under the diaphragm. Because if they come into the back, they're out of phase. Well, okay. I said, that's not enough. So what did I do? I took that large diaphragm, dynamic. I cut the whole bottom of the element out. I set it on top of what I call a collection tube. It's just a, a staff in there. And with a, a little rubber uh, a grommet that a little bit of support. Now up from the sides of this microphone comes the lows the mids the highs 360 degrees not four little holes and what comes of that is amazing first of all it's omni on the front you can be wherever you want to be how lovely but watch your screen if you've never seen this or know about it this thing is 40 db down in gain from the rear because it's out of phase. There it is. Oh, it still works. But it's 40 down. And so when it hit the market, oh, it went crazy. It, it was quite something for me because I didn't, I didn't realize what was going to happen. Uh, the entertainers all started using some of these great microphones. Television shows. By the way, I helped him get his license. That's Tim Allen. There's a ham radio station Sarah's sitting in front of that's active on that air. If you don't know about that, that's fun. Sad they're not going to renew their show next year's, but uh, several times a year they had plots uh, that fixtured ham radio we did all the microphones for that Sirius radio found out about the pr40 dumped their re20s and bingo they bought 250 pr40s a lot of them are doing the classic look and so we're very fortunate this is the podcaster's dream i like it for ham radio it's a pr40 but i rolled the low end off a little bit the pr40 gets down to 28 cycles no other dynamic will do that. And so I rolled that off a little bit. We don't need that much low end. Recording studios are using it. And it's all because of that. And again, I'm not an engineer. I barely made it through high school. 
Everything I did was voicing pipe organs, learning how to listen and paying attention. It, it was just a, a wonderful part of my life, designing elements that had exactly the right frequency response. They told us, the, the 4,000 scientists, they told us what to do. Why don't the manufacturers do this? Because I don't think they want to. They don't care about us. We're not a big enough market. And of course, for 35 years, Heil Sound headsets have been the, the leading headset for these many, many D expeditions. And I'm so proud. I, we support anything we hear about that we can help. And the backpack guys came to me and we developed this. What's wonderful for mobile and backpacks. It's all great stuff. Got another thing I better play for you. RF gain is very important. A lot of people just leave it wide open. Listen to what happens when we adjust it. It'll sound like, really like FM. Reducing that RF gain is very important, very. And then you cut out a lot of the background noise and, and a lot of people didn't know that. One of the things that guides so much of what I do and have done is phasing. Yeah, you hear the word, but do you really understand what they're talking about? Well, I'm gonna tell you within the next five minutes you will. You'll be an expert at it. Let me unplug this. I have two microphones. This is a PR22, different colors, because our custom shop did those for me. But I, I did a Y cord so that both of them are plugged into one cable. And they're all balanced. Everything's fine. But these two microphones, PR22, which I was commissioned by Paul Rogers of Bad Company to build for him. He wanted a microphone that really sounded nice and full, but had articulation. I didn't have to adjust it. It just sounds this way. When I talk into these two microphones, they're in phase. And if I bring this up to this one, I double my power. The same thing that happens if you take a 500 watt signal and you're not making it through the pileups because you didn't care about EQ. I don't need that stuff. So you go buy a kilowatt. Well, I'm going to be a lot louder. Are you? You're only going to gain three dB. You know how loud three dB is? Here it is. When I bring this up to here, it's three dB louder. Look at my meter. I should put a camera on there. There it is. Three dB louder. What? Close your eyes. Remember what I said about listening. It's a mental concept. I'm going to take away 3 dB. Double your power. One, two, three. The 4,000 scientists told us the human can't detect 3 dB. Only if we were in an echo chamber or something like that. It's just a little thought for you. And you go to bed tonight thinking, well, hmm. I have this magic little plug. Plug her in there, and plug this guy in. Okay, well, big deal, Heil. It works just fine. Yes, it does. Sounds just like the other one. Well, yeah, right. It does. But it's out of phase. When I talk into this one, the diaphragm moves down into the voice coil. When I talk into this one, the diaphragm comes up. If I talk into both of them, they will cancel. They're out of phase. You ready? Watch the screen and listen. One, two, three. What? 
Oh, they still work, but not together. Ha <laughs> ha. They're out of phase. Oh, my goodness. How many hours do we have? It's my favorite subject. Why? Because it so much relies upon phasing. How's the carrier deleted when West Shum brought a single sideband to ham radio? Let me unplug this. When West Shum brought a single sideband to ham radio, and by the way, that's just an interesting, if you had a trivia contest and you said, who brought sideband to ham radio? You'd all say Art Collins. He was six years late to the party. It was West Shum of Central Electronics that did it. Well, how did he, how'd he get rid of the carrier? Sideband doesn't have any carrier. How'd he get rid of the other sideband? We're just using lower or upper. How does the notch filter work? If some idiot that doesn't pay attention comes onto your frequency, you hit your notch filter, he's gone. How's that work? How did Dr. Yagi make the Yagi antenna? Huh? How'd he do that? He didn't have modeling. He didn't have computers. He, did, he barely even had, huh, a calculator. Here's how he did it. Took him years, probably. He put a a driven element resonant at the frequency he was working at. He had a field strength meter on down the line. When he made a director a little shorter and put it at the right spacing, by, and think about it, he had to just probably took him years to do that. He could get gain because it was in phase. Wow. But if he did one longer on the boom behind, that was out of phase. So when you turn your Yagi around, you don't hear the other guy. I always wanted to do a phased array. But I figured, man, you hear these big contesters and guys, and I don't have enough money for that. Well, I was totally wrong. When we moved to uh, second home down in the Ozarks, Sarah's mother lived there for a while. I had five and a half acres. Three and a half of it, I was able to put up a wonderful phased array. And I have a tremendous, just tremendous thing for you to listen to and watch. It all happens right here. We have just completed the installation of a 75 meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55 foot telephone poles Put them in an inverted V fashion, and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position, fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line, a 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried. And just the top of it shows. It's all sealed, so it's waterproof. But that's the way we get to switch all of the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches. It really works well. Take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west. Like a lot of people do, I, mine's usually three inches or so, Did you know, that's just after you done mow it. And uh, I know, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, we get a dry day. I'm, I'm going to have to lay out there and mow. That's just all there is to it because, you know, if you leave it that high, when it starts growing any at all, it's looking right. It's looking right good pretty quick. So uh, it's uh, it's to that point now, and uh, the system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also, note the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. The preamplifier, of course, make the meter read higher, but in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal to be more readable. Check it out. Yeah, well, I see they introduced a display on it, and uh, I don't know if that is their form of a uh, portal, portal, or what that is. Uh, you know why? Remember that hooked up to your computer, and then did you use your hand? 
pretty amazing stuff, huh? Just with a couple of coils of wire. <laughs> That's what's amazing about it. And I, I, it only has one relay. I used the Ameritron. This is what I had. Uh, DX Engineering makes these remote ones. Uh, but um, uh, it worked well. But the only thing is I don't like rotary switches. I hate them. So what did I do? I went to Antique Electric Supply in Mesa, Arizona. Write this down. These guys are a gold, line, gold mine of parts. Antique Electric Supply. And I bought Les Paul guitar switches. And I made a panel. And I could switch my east to west 40 meters, east to west 75 meters. It was cool. I use them here in my station. I switch all the other antennas and the radios. All these relays are remoted behind a console. I don't know why people don't use them. They're still using those stupid rotary things. No, and they're not reliable. I'm sorry. But these, these are great. But that's what we do. I mean, there's so many cool things. But all of this thing comes to a, a, a kind of a close here. All the years that I was working with the manufacturers, I asked them, what are you going to do about your receiver? Our receiver's fine. No, it's not. They're only thinking selectivity, noise limiters, all that kind of stuff. No, I'm talking about audio. The $15,000 ones maybe have two watts. All the others have one watt. But they're 10% distortion. It drives me out of my mind. Because I've just, over the years, learned to tune into these things. And you should, too, dissect what you're hearing. It's not all noise. It's distortion. Get rid of it. And then you need equalization. Well, we got it in our receiver. You got nothing. I know. I know. You can go over here and find a receiver thing. For, uh, it's not very good because it's still going through that stupid amplifier. And they're not the equalizer, as you learned, is not in the right place. Don't they know about the 4,000 scientists? No. And they don't care, obviously. So I said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tailor that receiver so we can listen our fatigue and have great EQ. And in order to do it, I wanted to do it with parametric. But I did it with a mix. I did a two, uh, the outer limits, the 160, 160 hertz and the 6K hertz. Those are just simple shelving, like, like the EQ200. And you can notch 160 or boost 160. You can notch 6K. And that's kind of nice. You can notch to some of that top end noise, that kind of stuff. But what's important, guys and gals, you already know the answer. It's 2.5K. We want to be able to slide that around from 400 to 4K. And away we go. Boy, because look at the transmitter bandwidth. It's right in the middle of that covering it well the first thing i had to do is build a speaker i get so ticked off there are so many of these junk speakers and they give you all these details and ramifications they're terrible they're little one two four watt things you can't have any headroom they give you their they won't give you their distortion <laughs> so Paul Clips to the rescue. He taught me how to do this. We built thousands of speaker cabinets back in the day, big ones, 15, 18 inch, 12 inch for the, uh, the, the production models. I found a really good manufacturer that makes a wonderful five inch speaker. They're an OEM company. They, they build them for people that give them the specs, which I did. Notice the magnets, big as a speaker almost. We put that in a cabinet after we did a free air cone resonance, took one of them outside, found out what the resonance was of that cone. Then we treated the cabinet to match that. The amplifier on the back has 25 watts, lots of headroom at 0.1% distortion. This is hi-fi spec. 
no, you're not going to use 25 watts. I do once in a while. I, I take these to different meetings and stuff. <laughs> I use it as a PA system. It's pretty cool. But then we come up with the equalizer. So what are you going to do? Like, what all do we need? Well, I listen to you intently. I really do. I get so many ideas from each of you that during we see you at ham fest or call me on the phone we talk we get on skype and people wanted things they wanted special things and so we did and this is what we did we have the input level the high filter at 6k We'll go, we'll switch over here. This is the low at 160 plus or minus. But here's the parametric. This is the gain. So you, you always want to leave a little bit of gain in it. And this is where we'll sweep it. Before we start, I put two headphone amps. Why? Because I have so many guys tell me they have a little bit of unbalance in their hearing. So you can put your left speaker here your right speaker here at different levels, either separate amplifiers, independent. You also can have a logger or you can have an operator, field day, the expeditions, whatever, contesting. And the other control is very important to me. It's a record out. These are all separate amplifiers. All this other cheap junk I see, they're just uh, resistive and you just... No, they have to be absolute separate channels. And then I take a cable, take that, plug it into my computer and make beautiful recordings. It works great. I've made some recordings that I did off air. And I do them on a, a digital disc. And, and what we're going to do is listen to some of these guys. We're going to set this all flat. Here's how you hear it in your receiver. Echo India is Bravo Lima Bravo. PI ATLB calling him by. Here's the way you hear him. Four Sierra Sierra Germany. Hope I have it right. Sorry to date you from Ireland. Name is Lim Lima India Alpha Mike over. It is flat. Hello, CQ, 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 Echo India is Bravo Lima Bravo. Is there any question? No, just how fast I can get it into my receiver, honestly. We're all getting older. Our hearing needs a little help. The articulation factor of what that does to signals is unparalleled. And I'm very, very proud to bring it to the, to the amateur radio fraternity because... I, I talk to so many people and, and they're all having such problems hearing. Well, that solves it. It makes great recordings. Uh, there's just wonderful things that we can do. And I, I'm constantly helping you guys. And the last I want to show you a little deal that to a lot, to a lot said, well, no big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. And that's the connectors that we have to use. All of these matching microphone things, they use a connector from Foster. It was built in 1960s for CB radio. There it is. It's got a little bitty thin little ring. You got to have needle nose to put it in some of the things. It's terrible. The cable clamp really bugs me. They don't have it to fit, so they put heat shrink or rubber tape around it because it doesn't fit the wire. What kind of lollygag thing is that? So I said, we're going to fix it. I went to Foster, got the release on their patent, and we have our own what we call stealth microphone connector. First of all, the ring's about a half inch wide. It's real easy to screw onto your connector. And the cable clamp, we tool that to meet our cable. 
First of all, there's two cable clamps. One for the little one, that's the push to talk line. You can plug your hand switch or foot switch in it. But the other one is for our wire. And when you secure that down into that cable, you could pull your car with that thing. It's that strong. It's never coming out. And we don't need any, any uh, rubber tape. The wire is magnificent. I designed this wire some years back. All of the wire we have, I don't care what it is. It's all 26, 24 gauge, little spindly stuff. The shield is a junker. It's, it's, it's just little copper junk. And when you, you try to separate it and you end up with two strands, you know what I'm talking about. The push to talks all inside it. You want to talk about an RFI generator. You've got RF all over the place because the DC is coming out of your power supply that runs your radio and your AC is going into the mic input. Well, that's the most sensitive place. Well, you just put yourself a nice little loop of RFI. Get rid of it. So I did. I have gotten rid of a lot of RFI problems for guys when they call me just by changing cable. The red and the blue are outside of that shield. They carry the DC. The balance line is AC. Why do I use balance line? All of our PR microphones are balanced. Why? Why do every radio station, television station, sound system, why do we use balanced line? You know the answer to that? It's very simple. Because the audio, the balanced line, is a minus and a plus. They go into a differential amplifier of your transmitter or a recorder, whatever. Whenever you see a balanced line XLR connector, it's coupling to two amplifiers, one minus and one plus. If any noise comes on that line, it can be a 50 foot, 100 feet. Gosh, in some of our, uh, uh, our sound systems, we had 500 foot, maybe 50 pair, but it was all balanced. Any kind of noise, got on that cable, what happened? They're out of phase. It cancels. So it doesn't pick up noise. You do that with an unbalanced one, it's not going anywhere except in the front end of your transmitter. See, nobody thinks about this, especially the manufacturers. What's wrong with you guys? Yesu did, for one. However, listen up. <laughs> I was the instigator here. The preamp board in all Yesus, in all ICOMs, all Kenwoods, they have a balanced input, but they don't use it. I said, thank you. Go ahead and use my design. I'll take it from there because all of our microphones are balanced. That's why our microphones sound better. They don't, not, not the quality of them, but they don't pick up a lot of junk. All because of phasing. That's why I love phasing. I could be here all day talking about it because it's my favorite subject. If none of you have this book, I advise you to do this. I didn't just write it. I compiled it. There's, there are notes in there that 60, 70 years old from all of those great scientists, Paul Klipsch, Larry Burroughs, all these wonderful people that helped me. And it's all there for you to read. Many of these are being sold by the case now to clubs, and they're giving them to their new licensee people. Last but not least, some years back, Heil Sound was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're the only manufacturer in the Rock Hall. That's, uh, that's that Quadrophini console I'm standing in front of. One of the monitors from that are my our uh, modular power amps and mixers the back side of it that's zz tops mixer we built for them number one serial number one uh, talk boxes there and a few years ago missouri university gave me an honorary phd degree if you think about it you're looking at a guy that just ba barely made it through high school 
but it's all because of ham radio. I, I repeat that so many times because I go in these places and the engineers and all that, they'll come to me. Oh boy, that's really cool. Where'd you learn all that? What, what college? I didn't go to college. Or, 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 where'd you learn it? Ham radio. No, no, no. I mean, where did you learn how to do this? Uh, amateur radio. No, you don't understand, kid. I said, no, you don't understand. I learned it all from ham radio and I'm still learning and I want you guys to learn because I'm still there. My soldering iron is no more than about three feet from me most times. <laughs> and I, I know these things take so long to put it all together, but dang it, you don't hear this kind of stuff, especially the history of it. Why? Because so many of us could be better amateurs if we knew a little bit more of how our gear worked. So I really appreciate you guys having me in today. It's really refreshing to, to have people that they want to learn. And as I say, if, if you have a club, you send me some dates, I'll be there. I mean, we're just going crazy. And we're going to pa pa pass the 200 mark here very soon, another couple of weeks. And I, I, I love spending time with ham radio operators. So Okay, Anytime, uh, do you think it will be a good time for questions? I actually can drive yeah. all of the viewers right here for the questions. I'm going to begin with a very special guest. Uh, his call is Charlie Mexico 2 X-Ray November. He's in Havana, Cuba. And he actually has been connected since uh, we start. And um, um, he has actually high products on his uh on his home on his house it's a friend of mine hopefully we didn't lose him i know the internet back in cuba is a little bit crazy but uh, i wanted to ask if um jose jose está por aquí se me dos xn i don't know if jose is here i don't see him on the list maybe we lost him but oh. as soon as he came here I will translate you because he doesn't speak English and I'll be, uh, you know, yeah. translating for you. Sure. He actually have uh, the headset, the microphone and uh, the boom, everything that he have is high. Up. And wow. he actually was the, uh, the winner, the world winner on 40 meter band wow. last year on the CQ worldwide. Wow. And uh, he says he won because he has the, Heil headset. Mm -hmm. He's very, 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 very happy with that, and he was so excited. In fact, the um, the uh, the Heil um, sticker that you sent to me, I'm going to send it to him because oh. I know he will use it yeah. very well there. So we we'll send that. We have lots of those stickers. Send me an email. I'll mail you one. <laughs> okay, that's great. So go. um, I'm going to start from the top. Sure. Jean Lamont, November 3, Sugar Hotel, uh, Mexico, who actually was the guy who put us together. Jim, uh, go ahead and ask any question you have, sir. I'm going to mute it myself. Well, I want to thank you, Bob, for uh, your time today. I learned a lot. Uh, I only have one question, really, and it deals with amplified microphones. Um, I'm sure your product line has amplified microphones. Am I correct? No. Never in a thousand years. Why would you need an amplified microphone? Yeah. No, answer that question. Why would you need it? Well, back in the 60s, I had a on CB, I had a D104, <laughs> and you could sit two, three feet away from the microphone and sound great. No, you wouldn't. No, you sounded, but you had the room echo. It drives me crazy when I hear that. And I absolutely, epit uh, I, did, I cannot tell you how I despise the 104. The really? chicken choker thing, give me a break. No, no, no. But... CB operators thought it was cool, and yeah. it is not cool. What is cool is a proper dynamic with the proper frequency response and the proper output to the nice preamp that's in your transmitter. And if it all is working good, 
that, that is the golden say, way to do this. No question about it. No. And you say, you say don't use compression or use no. that little? No, very little. If you need, why are you using it? It enhances my voice. It makes it louder. <laughs> do you have one of these? What well, kind it's of radio built into my radio. What is it? It's a seven ICOM 746 Pro. Okay. Go in there and adjust that equalization. You put only an ICM microphone on it, just like you use that D104 and a CB. You use the proper microphone into that proper radio and adjust it properly. I will absolutely guarantee you it will sound beautiful. True me. Okay. Yeah, do it. Well, I thank you for your time today, Bob. Now, and have hey, if you, nice, you have a problem... If you have a problem with any of that, send me an email. We'll get on Skype. I'll, I'll help you adjust it. We'll get on the air. All right. Okay. Well, have a nice Easter, Bob. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. Uh, appreciate uh, your question. And now we have the guy from Havana, Cuba. Oh, great. I want uh, Jose to mute. Jose, quita del el, el mute y pon tu cámara. ¿Estás aquí? A ver, ahí estoy bien. Uh, okay. Okay, Jose, dile hello uh, to Mr. Bob Heil. Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. Tradúceme, dile que es un placer saludarlo por esta vía, okay? Uh, he right. said, uh, it's a pleasure for me saying hello to you uh, via the Zoom conference. And, uh, well, uh, ¿quieres hacerle alguna pregunta? Desde, desde La Habana, Cuba. Yeah, from Havana, Cuba. All right. No, okay. no, no, solo, solo decirle que sus micrófonos y el hardware es lo máximo, lo mejor para los contes. Uh, he wants to tell you that your microphones and your headsets are the best for contest, and uh, he's actually the world uh, winner on a 40 meter, you know, single band. He's wow. number one in the world, number wow. one in America, and number one in Cuba uh, <laughs> last year. So he won because of your headsets and microphones. Oh, um, habla. Vete hablando y enséñanos el boom que tienes y, y el micrófono, loco. Ok. Es el uh, micrófono. Yeah, ICM. El ICM para, para el 7300. Uh, para el 7300, RC, 7300 RCM. Y el boom. Yeah. Y el boom oh, es de Hail también, sí. <laughs> y los audífonos. Thank you. Yeah. Son hail. Acá todos hail. <laughs> he says that everything that he has is hail. <laughs> he love it. You know, he says that uh, I make his dream come through because him and many people in Cuba love your product and even they cannot access to them uh, easy. They always wonder to have one of your products uh -huh. because they're the best. Well, I thank you. I thank you. I hope that hope that they all do work that great one. Congratulations on that award. My goodness. Lots and you saw work. the speaker? You saw the speaker that he has? Mm -hmm. Show the speaker. Enseña la bocina, brother. La bocina okay, que tiene de Hail. Pegatina, una pegatina, una pegatina Hail, sí, una pegatina Hail. Oh, he put the he put the stickers on the the Hail <laughs> sticker on the speaker. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> That's great. That's okay. great. Well, that's great. Uh, you want to tell him something before I uh, mute him and then pass to the next uh, guest? If you want to say something to him, Bob. Oh, well, uh, hey, congratulations and thanks for using our product. And always, if, if you have a problem, you email me and we can help you. It's one thing that I, I really pride our company in. We're very kind and helpful to everybody. And, and, Many times, some people not even using our gear, but they have a problem, and we can help you with that. So be aware, and I thank you so much for okay. using our stuff. Perfect. Uh, Jose, ¿tienes alguna otra pregunta o te, ya te vas a despedir? Un abrazo, entonces. Quisiera que fabricase un par de audífonos que sean livianos, livianos para los concursos, ¿eh? Okay. Que sean livianos, ¿sí? Ok. I got the question. Okay, he says if you have a, a, a pair of headsets that is uh, lightweight, like to hold it for uh, 48 hours in a road, 
if you have if you're planning to do something uh like a little bit lightweight uh probably would be our pro set it's good all right what what i like um i don't think i have it here this is our original headset built in 1985 it's still in the line and contesters back in those days they love it because it's very lightweight but it's got the great element in it that it sounds just like the big ones and it's real lightweight so. okay that's awesome i think yeah. that's the that's the you got him the thing is he didn't know it yeah. he didn't no know he says he didn't know that uh we uh, you have that and that's great So we're going to, uh, what is the model number again to, to look for and make sure he have one? BM10. Boom. BM10. Okay. BM10. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, gracias, uh, Jose. Okay. Mutea de Apore. Okay. Our next um, a friend that is going to ask you a question, if he has one, is America Bravo A, Papa Romeo, uh, well known as Papa Phil. For the ham community, he is a friend in need. He actually have a kidney problem, and uh, he he need a, a kidney donor, a living kidney donor. And we we run on a special event, Kilo for Papa, two weeks ago uh, with uh, a group of friends, including uh, uh, 100 watts and a wire, um, to get him or to spread the war and raise awareness about his situation. Papa Phil, go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh And thank you, Bob. You've been very informative. I really, I really loved what you talked about because I've been struggling a little bit with the uh, audio settings on my radio. And uh, so I got a couple questions. Um, you mentioned the fil and the filters. I have a Yaesu 991A, and um, you mentioned setting the bandwidth and the parametric filter at uh, two. But in your documentation on your website, it says five. I wonder if you could explain the difference on that. There again, you need to play with that. It really doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but okay. You know what I did today, as I said, as I you might have missed it. It's just a starting point, mm. and from there, listen in your monitor. I like to listen from another receiver. Put your transmitter in a dummy load, and put a little rubber duck or something on the other one you can hear, a and listen to yourself in the receiver and headphones. But those are just starting points. But uh, the that octave from two to five, that's it not plays a big part. And uh, I just start at two, and I'm most of the time that's all I'm using. So that's up to you, really. But yeah, what is important? You mentioned is, the transmit bandwidth. Yeah. Transmit bandwidth is that the settings that are marked um, like mode SSB, uh, low cut, high cut is in the menu is. Is that what we're talking about? No, I'm talking about the parametric equalizer. Okay, because so, all right, because it sounded like there was a separate setting you were talking about called just the transmit bandwidth from around 2.7 to 2.9. Yeah, right. So that, but you're talking about in 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 each individual parametric yeah, set. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. and no way. So one of the things is, be honest with me, is is this microphone any good? <laughs> oh, because it's a condenser. And it, those things are terrible. They, they, they just have, they have so much gain. And so what is that what you're using on your 991? Yeah, this is, I, bought, I, I got this a long time ago and I had an 847. Mm. And I was just, and I just modified it to work with this. Uh, yeah. But I know I need a better microphone. Yeah. I'd use the PR781 into that. It works great. PR781. Okay. Mm. Thank you. That's the one that I'm using. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Papa Phil. Appreciate that. And uh, let me mute you now and, and put the next uh, friend, which is uh, Kilo Zero, Romeo India, Charlie. Uh, our friend, um, um, Richard. Richard, unmute your phone. And if you have any question or if you want to say hello to Bob, this is your time. You got the two minutes of fame all over and over. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the, the pair, the parametric, uh, unit that you had for the, the receiver, one of the other guys last week told me about that. And he said it was like the difference between night and day. 
And I could see by your demonstration that uh, that's the case. Um, but I, uh, the other question I had, see, I was in broadcasting for 30 years mm -hmm. and I've always uh, liked the broadcast sound, you know, like a lot of guys on there. And in fact, right now I'm bidding on a, uh, uh, the 77 D microphone that you have. Uh, yeah. I, I saw one on eBay and yeah. I, I love those things. Uh, the, the other one too, that looks like the 44 BRCA. Yeah. yeah. I, I like all of those. Now, uh, I, uh, a long time ago, I was using a Sennheiser MD 421 because it sounded so good. And I had it going into a Kenwood because it matched 600 ohm. But I did not know about the, uh, at that time, about the voltage on the mic circuit. And after a while, all of a sudden, my Sennheiser quit sounding so good and started sounding like, like I was talking in a paper cup. <clears throat> and uh, I guess I burnt the coil out in it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, now, on like on that microphone, you, you've got one in front of you right there. Uh, the uh, Is there some kind of uh, like a, a filter? part that you put in there to keep the uh the line voltage and the mic circuit on the radio from uh doing harm to the microphone oh absolutely uh, what's the radio uh the one i'm uh, getting i just bought it and it's on its way is a kenwood ts2000 mm -hmm. well that and that doesn't you can uh I, the, in the menu you can dial up whether it has phantom power or not but um, if you want to make sure that you got it going on, this is all you have to do. It's really simple. You take the mic input or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the radio or mic output. You put a one microfarad capacitor, and that's, that's all you got to do. Bingo. <laughs> it's really simple. That will pass okay. AC. That will pass AC, which is audio, and it'll mm -hmm. block DC. And you can use anything, 0 0.47, 0 0.68. Those are, they might be a little easier for you to get than a one mic. But you run yeah. that from the, uh, the, the audio uh, hot uh, down to ground? Is that what you oh, do? No, 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 no. Oh, you put it in line? Yeah. Let me do this for you. Do, 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 do. Uh, you can do it in the base of the microphone, inside the microphone. Uh, and this is the microphone. See if this, my quick drawing there, you come out of that, it would be pin one is your mm -hmm. mic lead and put that cap in series with the microphone lead. The other, the other pin is ground, right? Yeah. yeah two leads and you take that and you go in series to the microphone and uh, you're done. We, we put them inside the connectors. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, Bob, let me uh, now give the chance to other friends. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Rich for the question. Now is the time for Bob November United three queen. Our good friend, uh, Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Hey, Bob. How you been? Long time to talk to. Oh, hi there. How are you? Uh, I can't complain that anybody would listen otherwise. Hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> or do hey. anything about it. <laughs> exactly. Um, hold on. Come take a okay, there we go. I'm on my iPhone, by the way. Uh, two things. I wanted to, number one, I got a 7300 from the man from the red suit for Christmas, along with a BM-17 mic. And I was watching your video then. I took a, I cheated and took a couple of screenshots of the audio settings. Hope you didn't mind me doing that. No, that's why I'm here. But I'm um, going back. Let me change here my view here to my radio. Okay, to control TX SSB. And those are the um, ideal numbers you should for like general use to start with right there, correct? Uh, yeah. Negative two on bass and plus three in treble. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. One to twenty nine hundred for wide and three hundred three hundred to twenty seven hundred for mid. You okay, you nailed it. Okay, I nailed it. Okay, good, hmm. awesome. Thank you. Now, 
that BM-17 is a BM-17IC, isn't it? Yes, correct. It's an IC. It's one with the um, electric um, for, my, for, for, um, mm -hmm. for all the ICOMs, yes. Because right. I know electric is for ICOMs and dynamics for like for right. ACE. You got it. Then, yep. And I think I wanted to ask one more quick question here. Um, um, I talked to you about this before. Um, I built this little, I built this go box a while back. Mm-hmm. The 7300 or 7100, and I wanted yeah. to, when you have time, I wanted to come on to Ham Nation and talk about how I built that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I'll, yeah, I'll be I'll follow you up on that and we can talk about that further. Yeah, sure. Good deal. Thanks, nice Bob. I, I appreciate it. Good, say, good talking to you. Good seeing you. And I'll tell Bob the stone you said hi. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, NU3Q. Thank you so much for your question. And we're going to go to the next one which is Chris, Kilo Yankee Ford, Charlie, Kilo Papa from Lacura Right Hand Radio Club. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, uh, Bob, thank you for the, uh, the presentation uh, tonight. Um, it's, for me, it's, it's always great to hear all that history and, uh, and hear about your great products. I, I do have uh, the Pro 7 in red, in fact, right. <laughs> that I use. Uh, and you, you, do, uh, I, you do know that if it's red, it's louder. Well, that's what I figured. That's what I figured. If it's red, it's got to be louder. My brother has the black one, and I'm pretty sure I'm louder than he is. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, really just to thank you for the, the presentation. I, I do work with another uh, ham club, so I, I'll take you up on your offer. I'll email you, and, and maybe yeah. we can put together a, a presentation for our group. Yeah. I, was, I wanted to thank Alex for inviting uh, me and, and some other folks to, uh, to try to show up today, but but we'll contact you and, and if you could do a yeah. presentation for our group, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Love doing it. And I'm going to be uh, going to be checking out some of your other products, the parametric uh, stuff um, pretty soon, I think, because it, it, yeah. it sounds great. So, but mostly, yeah, I just want to thank you for the presentation oh, and thank Alex that. for extending his offer to, uh, to attend. I appreciate that. Okay. Go no other question you have, uh, Chris, you don't have any no. other question. Yeah, that's it for me. Uh, Alex again. Thanks again. No, no, my pleasure. And uh, we have the, the audio guru here, so we have to take advantage of that. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, mister. Okay. The next friend that is going to ask you a question is Eric Kilo Delta 2, Hotel Whiskey Delta, our friend in New York. Go ahead, Eric. Floor is yours. Hi, Bob. Thank you for the wonderful presentation today. I learned a lot. Uh, I recently got the 705. And I was wondering, are you planning on building something where you can take advantage of the Bluetooth features of the 705 with one of your headsets? Uh, your audio is really low and dropping out. Do that again. Talk a little louder. Do it again. How about, how's the audio now? Still but low. Any better? How about now? That's better. Okay. I recently got the 705. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you're going to build a headset to take advantage of the Bluetooth features of the 705. No, I'm not much of a Bluetooth lover. I hate it, actually. So it won't be me to do that. <laughs> I know, I know. You can be wireless. But Bluetooth to me, I've never heard one that was not. It's all, I call it bubbly. It's never clean. It's never like analog. And, and it just, you know, it just, I guess I just am too restrictive of what I listen to and I want stuff to be clean. It is not. So I can't put my name on anything I don't believe in. Okay. I know that's not the answer you're looking for. I was just wondering, I didn't even know you had a headset out for that. Well, it just came out. Yeah. But and what is the model num what is the model number of the headset? You want to show that again, please? Because I H got curious in that. H T H I. I don't know if you can see it, doesn't make any difference, but it's yeah. right there. H T H I. Now, have you put thought into building one similar to what like I'm wearing now? Do what? Put one with dual speakers. Oh, yeah. We're we're I we're waiting on parts. Uh, I designed it. Let's see. Wait a minute. Uh, I thought I had. 
I had to prototype here, but uh, we're waiting on parts. And I'd say another couple of months will be okay. Then we'll be able to use a microphone or uh, our Pro 7 or whatever into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Eric, do you have any other questions? No, nope, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Okay, our next friend will be Justin, Kilo 4 Lima Econ of Bemberg. The floor is yours, Justin. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Bob. thanks, Bob, for the presentation. I uh, really enjoyed it. Those big PA speakers you built are awesome. Um, <laughs> I've got the uh, pro, uh, the pro set elite headset for I got a Yaesu 991A. Yeah. Is there a particular uh, microphone you recommend for that one, or just any of them good? No, what the 991? You see yes, that? sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, no, I mean if if you're looking for a microphone that's not expensive, you want to look at this. Not much talk about it. But this microphone called the HM12, it came out uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, there we go. Come on. It's, it's a dynamic, but the element in it I built for Fox News in Chicago some years back. And of course, anything today tooling is the expense uh, it costs so much we're talking twenty thirty thousand dollars to tool even like a little switch or something sometimes it gets really expensive so i my wife oh, oh, we, we did the thing with fox and we were finished with that my wife who owns the company said we need to build a microphone that doesn't cost a lot for some of the smaller radios, but it can't be junk. It's got to be quality. Well, there again, you're going to have $100, $150 in some of this stuff just off the bat. This one was already paid for, so to speak. The contract was up. I had everything done. I had a lot of diagram, uh, diaphragms and stuff. It's wonderful. Let me get it tuned up here. This thing is, I love it because it's 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 really great it's full and sound it's got the articulation and it's a hundred bucks and it works great with yesu hm12 and uh, it kenwood yesu all that elecraft uh, hm12 is the answer and i'm really happy with it because uh, a lot of guys you know want to invest in a lot of things so that takes care of it for you okay good deal now uh, if I go with one of those, I, I've got, you know, the, uh, I forget the, 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 no, or the letters on the adapter for the 991, but I got it for the foot switch and everything. Um, will the mic cord just plug straight into that? You don't have to run no phantom power or anything. No, no, drive. no, no phantom power. Okay. No, no, no. And, and what you have, you have an AD1Y adapter yeah. here's how this is it's so I, I do it simple but i don't know people don't hear about it maybe ad adapter one they're all one why yes is it a d one k what would that be for kenwood kenwood <laughs> <laughs> that's the way that works and but the Learn something uh, new every day <laughs> yeah and uh, the the uh the cc one that's the cable connecting cable one why that would be the, the cable for this and so on okay. there's some adaptations to some of that but it you know, lets you kind of know what we're doing but yeah it'll work great and it's a neat little radio okay that is awesome let's uh let's take the next one uh the next one will be kilo nine kilo romeo alpha with friend um kevin up in chicago he's actually your neighbor go ahead kevin or it's 500 yours. miles north yeah, I didn't realize you were that far. Well, my parents are from Southern Illinois. They're down by uh, by Carbondale, just south of Mount Vernon, actually. Oh yeah, yeah. Benton, they're from Benton, Illinois. Yeah, so. that, that's, that's why I mentioned that he's your neighbor because he told yeah. me that uh, actually, he's from. I actually, live in, I actually live in Waukegan, yeah. north of Chicago. So yeah, but do, do you have a factory up here in uh, Elk Grove or something? Don't you, Bob? Or nope, Fairview Heights. 
Fairview Heights. So, okay. 12 miles great east of the Great Arch of downtown St. Louis. Okay. I was thinking of something else then, I guess. Um, I've got the ICM microphone for my ICOM 7300, but uh, recently acquired a, a Flex 6600. And um, I'm using their, I hate to say this, but their headset um, with it because I didn't know any better. Uh, it, and not that it's a bad headset or anything, it works, it's working just fine, but I'm looking for a, a proper microphone for it um, that I can, you know, put on my, on my boom here. I've got a boom as well, but this, here's the ICM right here. Um, but um, maybe I'm looking for, looking for you know, for a recommendation for a microphone, 781 or the PL40, or I even like that 77D, but my question is, um, which one, and I do have a balanced input on the radio itself. It's a quarter inch um, jack. Um, and would I get that cable from you or do I have to get that from Flex? And you don't build a cable with a quarter inch on it. Okay. So you might have to, you could make your own. That's another thing, that's easy. Okay, but, but coming up the back of your microphone, I don't know what kind of connectors you have. You do, what do you do? Just rag chew or contest or what? I do both. Both. Yeah, rag chew, rag chew contest. I've got different profiles set up in my uh, 7600, 6600 for mm -hmm. contesting and for, for rag chewing. Um, so I, I would need a microphone that would be diverse enough. And the, I don't know how you're familiar with the 6600 with the flex radios, but they, I've got uh, like an eight band equalizer built into the radio. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I'm I, assuming. I would look at the 781 or the PR40. That's what most flex users are using. Okay. 781. Yeah. Okay. And does that come with the, with the proper cable or do I have to order a cable with that? No, well? you'll have to get a cable for it also. Mm -hmm. And the cable I would get from. You'll have to get it from them because we don't do any phone jack things. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I noticed on your website too, the, the PL40, it's $329. Three, you got 329 the, the prices. You need to adjust the price on there. It's, it's, no. it's You go hunting bad. around dealers. Huh? You go hunting around to some dealers and you'll get some deals. No, I'm just saying the, it doesn't display right on the on your on your website. It says... Uh, if you look at the, um, if you go to the website, look at the PL40, the price is in, it's, it's like 18 digits, 18 oh, digits. Yeah, long. yeah. We're, <laughs> we're right in the middle of reconstructing that. It's going to be an all new thing. Something happened to that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and they're, they're just going to wait, they're going to wipe the whole thing. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I think I've heard your presentation before, but I learned everything. I learned something new every time I, every time I hear you. So I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, supporting us hands out here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. My pleasure. And uh, let me go to the next one, which is going to be Paul. Kilo Charlie 7 Sierra Echo. Paul, the floor is yours. On mute and talk. Thanks, Alex. And uh, Bob, really a wonderful presentation. Um, it's just a shame you haven't had some life experiences that would be of interest to people. <laughs> Thank you. I'll wait and see hearing me. Okay. Um, I'm running an FTA, FTDX 101 MP in, a, in your Pro 7 headset. Yeah. And uh, you've already answered the question about, because uh, there aren't specific settings on the website, your website for the, the 101 mm -hmm. MP, but um, I think I'll go back to the general ones that you talked about today and start tweaking there. Yeah. My, my question is this, that if I find those optimum settings for my radio and the Pro 7, and then go to um, a, a boom mic. Uh, a what boom mic would you? What, what mic would you recommend for the 101MP? And would the parametric settings be the same across the mics, or would they have to all be tweaked and tuned again? Not really. It's a pretty good starting point, and you might want to tweak one or two. Listen to yourself and make sure uh, you might you might need a little bit more mid-range, a little bit more low end, that's up to you. But no, you're, you're, you're in the ballpark with both of them. And uh, <clears throat> there again, that unique, do you 
to contest mostly? You do rag chew or what? Yeah, it's mostly rag chew. And I would look at a PR40. But okay. Not, there, 781, either one of those would work great. Okay, great. Hmm. And uh, my first uh, uh, headset was, in fact, the BM10, and I used hmm. it until those little foam uh, pieces on the earpiece actually rotted off. And, well, uh, let me tell you in the world, every piece and part of anything we have ever manufactured is available. You can call the plant and order heads and, and they're on our website. You go into parts and pieces and all that. Uh, you can buy just the foam, foam pads. You can buy the, the, for the microphones, the screens and, and little screws or whatever. It's all available. So yeah. put yeah. it, 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 it had been sitting in the drawer for a long time and it yeah. had, uh, it had suffered some other perils that were non-repairable. So. Yeah, there you go. We got, we got those parts too. Yep. It, it has gone for it. Again, thank you very much. I learned a lot. I yeah, appreciate your time. Thanks again. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, yes. Pleasure to have you here today. The next uh, is not here. He's international. He is actually from Suriname, South America. His name is Judel, Papa Zulu to Yankee Tango. Judel, unmute yourself and ask any question you want to Mr. Bob. Uh, yeah. Hello, Mr. Bot. I don't have any question. It uh, was a nice presentation. I want to say uh, hello to you from uh, Suriname, the former Dos Guyana. And uh, we are here. We, we are looking for use your products also here in, uh, in this country. We are only five, uh, four or five um, amateur radio stations here uh, mm. at the moment because uh, our population is uh, half million only. We are a small country. But uh, I just want to know uh, you to know that we we know about you and uh, <laughs> we saw a lot of videos from you in uh, YouTube and uh, so. Uh, well, one more you. time, thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate place. that. Anytime I can help, send me an email. Thank yeah, you, sir. Thanks. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Jadel. Mute yourself and let me go to the next frame, which is going to be uh, Todd, November three, Papa Kilo, Japan. Todd, the floor is yours, sir. Hi, Bob. I, I met you three years ago when you were in my area um, at, uh, during a presentation for the Mercer County, Pennsylvania oh, yeah. um, a radio club at uh, Shenango Valley, uh, Penn State, and uh, love listening to you. Um, I learned something every time, and it was that presentation three years ago that really helped me the most. I grew up around um, good home audio equipment thanks to my father. And it was that presentation that allowed me to get into my head um, how to translate that to amateur radio because I couldn't make the, the connections and mm -hmm. uh, learn a bunch of stuff here again uh, today. So <laughs> thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. That's what I do. I just have to share this because God gave it to me. I, it, it, it's, it, it, I don't understand why we don't hear more about it because sure, there's other guys that knew all this, but I just, I guess they don't want to take the time. I do. Um, I think it's vital because that's how I learned too from all these different Elmers that I had, and these were big time guys. I mean, you think about a hey, Paul Clips to fly his airplane to come and get me. <laughs> That's what's always crazy about it. These guys come to me. It's like, why? What did I do? Well, it's the fact that I was doing something that nobody else was, but I didn't know it. And they wanted to know what's this nut doing, you know? <laughs> so I, I'm glad to share that with you, and I sure do love that club you're in. Wow, Tim Duffy and all the guys there. That's great. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Uh, okay, well, now we have our next uh, friend, which is Randy, Kilo Zero Romeo Whiskey Bravo. Randy, the floor is yours for your questions. Thank you, Alex. And uh, Bob, thank you so much for the presentation and taking the, uh, the time to talk with us today. And uh, every time I do talk with Alex, he goes to my QRZ page and shows a picture of you and I at a ham fest uh, north of Springfield. 
oh, probably half a dozen years ago. And uh, I am a little bit taller than you, but he uh, has a few choice words as well. But <laughs> anyway, you were the MC, and I actually won a radio, and we got a ch chance to talk briefly after being on the air. A couple of three weeks earlier, uh, you helped me on the air set up my uh, FT950, which was, uh, which was very, very helpful. Uh, anyway, a, a quick question. Um, I have now got the new FTDX10, and um, I am using a friend's 101 settings uh, with a small adjustment in the mid-range. Mm -hmm. But do you have or do you suggest other settings uh, either on your web page or, or what you're seeing out there now that maybe uh, would be published anytime soon? Well, we're working on a new site, but no, all of those are really good starting points and uh, it, it gets you in the ballpark. So you probably will be okay. okay. You're using the 781 for, with it? Well, it's funny you should say that. I'm sure you know Dan over at Associated Radio in uh, Overland sure. Park. Yeah. Um, I, when I had the radio two days, I took it over to Dan with my headset put on the bench and he allowed me to try the HM12, the Goldline Elite. Uh -huh. the PR40 and the PR781, mm -hmm. which, which was a great selection. I'm glad that Dan has that type of selection. Yeah. And uh, we came home with the 781 and um, yeah. that's great. what's in front of me right now. Yeah. Um, right. And Alex always says it sounds good on the air. I think everybody else does as well. So I think it's a good match. Yeah. Super. I have the 781. I may not tell you, I don't change this mic for nothing. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Bob, well, real, real quick, do you suggest putting a uh, a muff on the 781, or just leave it the way it is? Well, it sounds okay. You, you're not exiting a lot of air. Some people have a, they really do, but I don't hear any big pops or so on. So I think you're okay. But we do make a. Uh, that's one thing about that. It, that muff is. Uh, uh, I have it in here. It's here. It's a biggie. Yeah. I have it in here. Uh, I, I have it on my microphone and I have it in here as well. well I have an extra Alex, one. I expect you to send that to me then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing about all of these during all the COVID and stuff, you can wash these things. And a lot of times people do that just to keep the microphone clean. I just did. Uh, uh, it, it shows up somewhere. I just did a video for Gigaparts on how to clean your microphone and cables. You might want to go look at it. It's on YouTube in the Gigaparts page. Uh, and we just, just put it up there a couple of days ago. You might want to learn something. I'm going to fold it into some of these presentations too, because it's important that you clean your microphone and your cables and how to wind your cables, all that. So yeah, check it out, Gigaparts. There, they have a website on YouTube. Check that out. Well, okay. Bob, thanks again for your time. Be safe and be well. Thank and you. we look forward to uh, having a okay. chance to talk with you again. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Randy. Hey, Bob, I want, um, I want to tell you that uh, we have a bunch of friends also watching us. And I want uh, you to know that um, our friend Andy Crowley, 2 Echo Zero, Romeo Echo Echo, two echo zero Romeo Echo Echo, Mr. Uh, Andy Crowley from the UK. He's actually been very active watching everybody here and uh, uh, he's on it. And uh, Delta Echo two Tango Romeo Fox, Mr. Trustin, and Kilo Yankee four Tango Golf. Those are their three friends that are always watching and listening everybody through their commenting. The, the comments are great. I don't see any question from anybody on the chat. Uh, asking any questions. So I think uh, I will pass it to you. I wanted to let you know that we have a friend in common. Uh, he, his name is Peter the Great, the guy with the call books. I don't know if you remember him. I do. Of course you do. Yeah. And, Peter's a good guy. We've known each other for decades. <laughs> yeah. And he told me that he told me on his story that, man, that amazed me uh, when um he found your friend and talked to his wife and stuff. That was great. Yep. Yep. Your friend from, uh, from school. Oh, mm -hmm. man. Yep. That was awesome. That's what ham radio is about, isn't it, Alex? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. And uh, my son is here, Alex. Hey. Hey, hello. Hi. <laughs> How you uh, doing? He, he, he got very excited uh, with uh, his 
your QSL card. I told you okay. earlier. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we're very happy to have you here and uh, everybody that are here tonight, uh, this afternoon, been very pleasant and uh, you explained everything on point. And uh, like we say, you are the audio guru. You know what audio guru is, right? The, 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 you are the man on the audio. So thank you so much for well, your help for I'm being here the, tonight. I'm not the only one, but I, uh, I've learned a few things from some of the masters. That's, that's the big deal. I was just so blessed hey, Bob. To, to come to it. Yeah. Bob, that QSL card you sent Alex, you think I could get one? Oh, I got to send me one. That's a shark QSL card. <laughs> Just send it. Look, look up my calling. Uh, All right, we'll do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Well, All it's right. been absolutely wonderful, everybody. I'm so happy that Alex put this together. And anytime you want to do more, let us know. And what yep. I do after I've done these almost 200, we're coming back doing repeats, but they pick out a subject like one. One of them, they really wanted to get into. Uh, well, yeah, next thing. time that I want you, uh, when you have a chance, I want you to talk more about the parametric uh, yeah. equalizer. I think uh, that is a product that we'll get in the future, in the near future. And a lot of people are wondering to know about it. So I don't know if you can come. Uh, I mean, I'm going to give you a break, of course, next yeah. month, whenever you have a chance and talk specifically on that item i think is remarkable i think is very very good uh to have uh you talking about that product yeah that's that's what we're doing we're coming back and you know, you've heard all of my history and there's more and more and more but we don't get into that but pick out a subject of phasing or antennas i got a really cool thing on antennas you do that i'll be glad to do it for you so okay well seven three to everybody happy easter and do not do not go through this weekend without understanding why we celebrate Easter. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much and uh, appreciate it. Guys, 73, 73 to the guys on the chat. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much, Bob. See you guys okay. on Monday. 73. Right. 73 is Bob. Bob. Thank Happy you very much. Bob. So Happy long. Easter, Bob. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy Twitter, Easter. Bye. 73s, we're going to end them up the live stream. Thank you so much.